Well, welcome to worship this morning. We're so happy that you could come and join us for worship. Today is a healing service. At the beginning of the uh, service, we'll have a time for healing. You can uh, come forward and either kneel or stand along the railing, and you'll receive a sign of the cross in uh, an oils, be anointed with those, and then a laying on of hands with a blessing. And it's completely optional, um, but if you'd like to come forward uh, and ask that you give your name when you when the assistant comes um, to offer healing so that we can say your name in the blessing. Photo picture directory pictures are being taken today till 1.30 in the fellowship hall, so uh, please go and get your picture taken for the directory. Also, Jan Schnapp, who was a longtime member who passed away this week, um, her funeral was yesterday in Augusta, Missouri, and there will be a memorial service at Messiah in upcoming weeks. Also, Messiah has been nominated by the Council of Churches of the Ozarks for an award at their fifth annual Celebrate Compassion Recognition Dinner on September 28th. If you'd like to attend that, uh, let us know in the office so that we can uh, give them a number of who would be attending from the church. We did uh, purchase a table, so um, if you would like to attend that, uh, let us know by the 21st. Finally, next weekend there will be congregational forums. Uh, if you were a member of the church, you would have received a packet uh, probably in this last week, and it's what it is is the report of the uh, team that was formed last year called the Vision and Mission 2.0 team, and uh, we will be meeting next weekend at 4 o'clock on Saturday the 23rd, and then after each of the services, so you could come at the uh, 9.45 time or um, after worship here. And uh, there will be some snacks to kind of hold you over if you go to the one that's after this worship. So I invite you to please come to that, and uh, we can ask questions and review that information that was provided by that report. Um, all other announcements you can note in the messenger. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we come today with our burdens and our needs, with our pains and with our wounds, and we lift them up for your healing, for your relief, and for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing.
Let us pray. Great God, our healer, by your power, the Lord Jesus healed and gave hope. As we gather in his name, look upon us with mercy and bless us with your healing spirit. Bring us comfort in the midst of pain, strength to transform our weakness, and light to illuminate our darkness. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, grant your healing grace to all who are sick, injured, or disabled, that they may be made whole. Hear us. Mend broken relationships and restore those in emotional distress to soundness of mind and serenity of spirit. Restore to wholeness whatever is broken in our lives, in this nation and in the world. Hear us, O Lord of life. You may be seated. I invite you, brothers and sisters, to join me in this healing time of our service. We'll have a song you can sing, and at that time you can come forward and, as I said, stand or kneel along the railing, and the um, ministry assistants will approach you with anointing of oil and a healing blessing.
Let us pray. Receive this power of healing and blessing upon you that you may know that God is your great protector, that you may stand by those walls and shields of protection when life is difficult and attacking, that you are safe, that you know that brokenness is repaired, that illness may be healed and that there may be mending of your spirit and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. The reading today is from Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brother said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong thing did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, we are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for I am in the pla for am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. And if any kids would like to come forward, uh, we'll have a time for children's message. Morning. So I have a question. When you guys go running outside and yelling and playing, do you breathe faster or do you breathe slower than you were breathing right now? Faster. faster. Yes. And what would happen if you went out and you were running and playing and yelling and doing all of that and did it while holding your breath? Do you think that would work? No. Why is that? What do we need? Yeah. Yeah, we need oxygen. And the more we move around, the more air we need, the more oxygen we need. So keep that idea in mind that we need more of one thing in order to do another thing. And then I want to tell about a, a story that Jesus told. And it's a story about uh, someone who owed a ton of money to a king. And he was, the king wanted his money back. He wanted his debt paid. And so the king asked for it, and the man didn't have the money, and he begged for forgiveness of his loan, and the king forgave it. In fact, he basically said, um, it's okay that you can't give the money back to me. Let's just forget about it, and you don't ever have to pay me back, which was pretty nice of the king, right? I mean, Wow. But the same day, the man who just got forgiven tons and tons and tons of debt ran into another man who owed him a little bit of money. And that man didn't have the money on him at that moment. He wanted to be paid back. 
And instead of doing what was done unto him, he shook the man and took him by the neck and put him in jail. He didn't forgive him. Now, he kind of gets in trouble for not doing that. But remember we were talking about you have to have some more of something to do another, so you need to have a lot of air to, to run around and stuff. Well, same thing with that story, um, except it's about forgiveness. So when we're running around, it's easy to breathe more, right? Our bodies just automatically do it. But when we need to do some big forgiving, um, we have to actually remember that we are forgiven, and we got plenty of forgiveness in it that we can share it with others. And that's why Jesus told that story, was to remind us that when someone needs forgiveness from us, to remember that we've got plenty of forgiveness in us that's been given to us by God, that we can share it with the other person. And uh, that is kind of the lesson of that story. And so I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Just repeat after Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who teaches us about how to forgive us, how you forgive us, so that we can forgive each other. Thanks. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you all. I invite you to share that peace with one another. Well, today I want to speak to you about the book of Genesis. Now, Genesis begins with a creation story, and there's actually a few creation stories within the book of Genesis. But the first one you may be familiar with is the story of Adam and Eve. And at one point in the story, Adam and Eve really mess up. And when they mess up, God shows up. And though they have to face the consequences of the choices they make, they are still loved and provided for. And God goes with them as they live out their new normal. Eventually, as you read the book of Genesis, you come across a couple named Abraham and Sarah who were promised a family that would change the world. And that would right the wrongs of God's good creation that were occurring in God's good creation. But they had no child. And when Abraham was feeling the most uh, doubtful and dejected and depressed about all of that, uh, God shifts his perspective by showing him the skies and all the stars and saying, your generations will be greater than the number of stars in heaven. Trust me, I am a good creator and I am a promise keeper. And Abraham did trust that promise. Eventually, Abraham and Sarah do have a son, and they name him Isaac. Now, Isaac goes on to have twins, Esau and Jacob. Isaac loved Esau, and his wife loved Jacob. There's kind of a pattern in these blessed families of the Bible of a lot of dysfunction. You'll especially see it in the next generation of Jacob's children. 
See, through a journey of lies and wrestling and blessings, Jacob comes to have 12 sons. And like his parents did, he loves one of his sons more than all of his children. And it is his second youngest son, Joseph. Because of this, he gives Joseph a fancy coat, which is a sign that Joseph is being groomed to become a manager and the boss of the family business, that he is not going to go into a manual labor profession like his brothers. And this was culturally very odd because generally, culturally, the oldest son is the one groomed to be the boss, to run the family business, not the second youngest. But there's a little dysfunction and drama going on there. See, Reuben, the oldest son, is out of favor with dad. Because you read in Genesis 35, so we're reading Genesis 50 right now, so all the way back, Genesis 35, and you read the story of how Reuben has an affair with one of his dad's wives. So he's out of favor. And Joseph is a complete jerk. He is a jerk about being the favorite. See, he had this tendency to lord it over his brothers whenever he could. And because of this, his brothers hated him. They hated him so much that they schemed to kill him. But Reuben maneuvers a little compromise and convinces his brothers to stick Joseph into a well, into a pit, rather than kill him. He's hoping that when they cool off, he can uh, help Joseph to escape. Now, Reuben is not doing this out of his beloved love for his brother. He's thinking about himself. If he saves Joseph, he might get back into good favor with good old dad. But the opportunity comes to sell Joseph into slavery. And when that knocks on the brother's door with more income received than they ever could make as shepherds, they cannot resist the temptation. So they lie to their father and tell him that his favorite son is dead. They get rid of their arrogant, pain-in-the-neck brother, and they get rich. So Joseph ends up in Egypt, where he experiences many ups and downs. He ends up working for the house of a government official, where he is recognized for his great intelligence and skills as a manager. He's been groomed his entire life for this kind of work of managing a household and, and business. And so he's recognized for this, and he comes to establish good stature as a slave. But then he's falsely accused of assault, and he's sent to a prison pit. Back in the pit. But word of his ability to interpret dreams comes to the ear of Pharaoh, who's having nightmares that no one can interpret for him, and he wants to understand. And so Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream which basically says there's a famine coming to Egypt. And because of this foreknowledge, Egypt is able to prepare for this famine, and Joseph rises to great power as he's set in charge of all the distribution. And so from one prison hole to the next, from one pit to the next, he rises to the palace. Pit to the palace. During the famine... Joseph's brothers go to Egypt because they are starving, and Egypt has supplies and resources. And when they go there, they are surprisingly reunited with their brother Joseph. And they're scared, because not only have they reunited with Joseph, he's in control of everything. But Joseph is merciful, even though 
Really, when you read that passage from Genesis 50, his brothers never ask for forgiveness. Instead, they do kind of what is their nature, and that's manipulate. They try to manipulate him by saying that their dad wanted Joseph to forgive them. But Joseph sees through that deception. And yeah, he has the power to destroy his brother's lives forever, to take revenge, but he does not. Instead, he begins to weep, for he still loved them. And when you read all that, you kind of wonder how. How could he do that? And Joseph, he knows in his heart of heart that though they, his brothers, had planned something horrible, bad for him, God brought about a greater good, something that saved many lives. For behind what they were doing, underneath everything that was happening, God was doing something good. God was making everything right again. But that can be a stumbling block. This idea that something good out of our struggles, can, that God can bring something good out of our struggles, that can be misunderstood. Right, because with that logic, when you kind of follow that line of logic, what you're saying, isn't it, is God plans your sufferings? And that feels manipulative and an abusive plan. And is that really how God works? But the story of Joseph is not saying that. That's not what it's claiming. Not at all. For God did not plan the ups and downs of sufferings. That was sin's plan. Joseph's brothers made choices. They were not forced by God to sell Joseph into slavery in order for some great puppet master plan to be filled out. Remember the story of Adam and Eve and how they break the one rule in paradise? They ate of the tree of knowledge and evil, and even though they knew that they were not supposed to do that, and as a consequence, their life changed. They knew things that would cause them suffering and sorrow, and they did them anyway. Yet when they messed up, God showed up, took care of them, and went with them wherever they went. The plan of God is that what gets us through the mess-ups to reach our divine potential and sometimes those mess-ups are the choices we make, the sin of ourselves. Sometimes it's the sin of others that affects us. But either way, God will get us through the mess-ups that we may reach our divine potential. For God is our creator, is a creator of steadfast love, a God of promise, and the promise is to see us through from the pit to the palace. And Joseph lived that. He knew it. He lived it. It was not God's plan for Joseph to be a slave, yet Joseph's skills and the manager and his abilities enabled by God to save Egypt and the brothers who sold Joseph into slavery in the first place. And Joseph was a dreamer. He dreamed that he would have great power one day, and that his brothers would bow down to him. And that happened, but it didn't happen in the form that Joseph imagined it would when he was a young boy and a jerk to his brothers. But it still happened because that dream was actually in alignment with what God was dreaming for Joseph as well. See, he dreamed of running the family business. Instead, he ran a nation. Listen to your dreams. Pay attention to them. Listen to when God enters into your dreams. How have rough patches and hard times in your life inspired hope? 
How have you been strengthened in your abilities in struggle? How have you been encouraged to persevere in your dreams? For God hears our prayers. God is listening. So tell your dreams to God and then pray this. Pray for God to manifest them even beyond what you can imagine at this time that this or something even better may manifest from them. For God is listening and will transform the trials that you face to keep you on the path of your dreams. For they also are God's dream for you. See, we are worthy of love and belonging and that we can stop hiding. For love finds you anyway and is with you everywhere you go. For God knows you and searches you and blesses you. And God enables us to forgive. And in forgiveness, this is the crazy thing, in the forgiveness, we open a future that the past unforgiveness was blocking off from us. God heals our brokenness. For God shows up when the going gets tough, heals and repairs when the damage is already done, and sees us through from the pit to the palace. Amen.
Good and gracious God, we pray for the church. Bless the congregations in our community and across the world that we may give transformative and life-giving gospel to be heard. Lord, care for your creation. Help us to be the stewards that we are called to be, to protect this good creation and to make right that which is wrong. God of nations, you love all tribes and peoples and languages, and we pray for those who govern. Give them wise and generous hearts for those they serve. We especially lift up the city of St. Louis as it struggles this weekend with its identity and its pains and wounds of past. Divine healer, calm the anxiety of those who are wrongly accused, who suffer under crushing debt, who are in prison. Reassure those who are lonely and impatient and brokenhearted. Be with those who are homebound, hospitalized, or ill. We especially lift up Matt Henry, Chris Snyder, Kathy Kutzer, and Dana. We pray for all the saints and everyone who has come before us to teach us about your ways. We especially pray for Janet Schnath and her family and friends and our sympathy to them. And Lord, we pray, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's good and right to give our thanks and praise, for we have been given this gift. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to all to drink, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And whenever we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we do so, remembering Christ died, Christ risen, and Christ shall come again. And gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The meal is prepared and all are welcome to receive this meal of forgiveness. You will receive the bread. You may come forward and then kneel or stand along the railings and you will receive uh, bread and then either the dark liquid, which is wine, or the light liquid, which is grape juice. And there are gluten-free elements available. Just let your server know. Come let us eat.
I invite you to stand as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. And receive the congregational blessing. May the power of God strengthen you. May the love of Jesus Christ heal you. And may the wisdom of the Holy Spirit guide you now and forever. Amen. Start a fire in my soul, fan the flame and make it grow, so there's no doubt or denying Let it burn so brightly that everyone around can see that it's you, that it's you that we need. Start a fire in me. You are the fire, you are the flame, you are the light of the darkest day, this day. Start a fire in me. 